In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the temple by her parents, St. Joachim and St. Anne. When the Blessed Virgin Mary was presented as a tiny little girl to the Virgin, to, to Almighty God, and Venerable Anne Mary of, of Agreda, Mary of Agreda, who um, appeared actually and bilocated from Spain in, in these these territories and down in Nor uh, New Mexico and Texas. She said that at age three, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary had already totally consecrated herself to God, and at age at a very young age she entered the temple through her parents. So here in Cortez. Colorado, named after uh, a great Spanish conquistador who went into Mexico and fought for Our Lady and uh, combated the, the pagans who were massacring uh, up to 80,000 victims on the pyramids, ripping their hearts out and chopping their heads off to Satan. And uh, all the blood and all the carcasses stunk up the whole city of Mexico and many other cities where all these human sacrifices were taking place. So Cortez, one of the great things he did was to put a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary on top of the pyramid. And he declared war against these priests and uh, the followers of this pagan religion. So he fought for the Virgin Mary and uh, triumphed to bring the Mother of God and later, when she appeared in Mexico, she uh, sealed his victory, started by Cortez. So it's always a joy to come to a city named after so great a Catholic conquistador. Listen to these words of Pope Leo XIII. Let the priest not trust in his own strength, nor be complacent in his own gifts, nor seek the esteem and praise of men, but let him imitate Christ, who did not come to be served, but to serve. And Leo XIII says, And therefore, as we have nothing more at heart than the good of, a Christ of Christian interests, and deeply moved as we are by the peril in which the people now stand, we exhort you, venerable brethren, he's talking to his bishops, more earnestly than ever to unite your care and loving efforts to ours, to the popes, that a remedy for so many evils may be found. So this is Bishop, this is Leo XIII, writing to the bishops in 1882. And first, endeavor to make your people understand of what value the Catholic faith is to them and how they ought to defend it at every cost. How we ought to defend the Catholic faith at every cost. But since the enemies and the assailants or attackers of the Catholic name employ a thousand devices and a thousand um, deceits to seduce those who are not on their guard, it is of the first importance to unmask and drag into the light of day their secret machinations, their secret plottings, so that Catholics, having their eyes open to the real aims of these men, may feel their own courage redoubled and may resolve openly and intrepidly to defend the Church, the Roman Pontiff, and their own salvation. That's Leo XIII in his letter Et Sinos to the Italian bishops in 1882. So it is a great um, letter telling the bishops to warn the people that the greatest interest is to defend the faith at every cost and expose the rats. And Leo XIII will also say that to the bishops of the world with Freemasonry. He says to them, tear the mask off. Tear the mask off these Freemasons 
who have lower level at the lower levels they have the shriners that take care of crippled children and uh, collections for the poor these pope leo the 13 says these are the these are the masks to cover the real uh, higher levels there's many there's 33 degrees in masonry and uh, the highest levels are given totally to satan and at the higher levels of course they vow to destroy the catholic church to to remove christ the king out of society at every level especially church and state they have always fought to bring about church and state the separation of church and state and of course as catholics we want the union of church and state under christ the king because as leo the 13th says the the church is to the state what the soul is to the body and if you separate the soul and the body what do you have <laughs> you got a dead body right if you separate the church from the state you have a dead society and the state can make whatever laws it wants without facing any uh, penalties or excommunications or punishments from the church and christ gave to the pope the highest authority over any secular or civil authority and the pope has a right to excommunicate and correct and uh, discipline even president obama and uh, of course these modern popes are filled with poison of modernism and collegiality and they believe in religious liberty and they believe in the separation of church and state which is a condemned heresy many times many times by the church so in this time we are in we are in a very peculiar crisis of the church because we are now 50 years after vatican ii and vatican ii was the great triumph of freemasonry within the catholic church and their whole goal is to tear her down they want the catholic church destroyed they want our lord jesus christ buried six foot under and forgotten completely forgotten or just remembered as another good dude good another do-gooder like abraham lincoln if you can say that <laughs> but the freemasons make a mockery of christ by putting him on, on an equal level with muhammad with buddha with Joseph Smith of the Mormons and all the false religions and to put the true God at an equal level of these false as the scripture says the gods of the Gentiles are devils to put Christ at an equal with all these devils is a terrible blasphemy against God and that was the greatest sin of Vatican II to attack Christ as God and as King to remove his crown and by promoting religious liberty which is a heresy that promotes <coughs> the state to be neutral on matters of religion that is a serious serious crime so we are now 50 years after vatican ii was vatican ii the great promised renewal of the church <laughs> did vatican ii fill the seminaries fill the convents especially the contemplatives it emptied them destroyed them did vatican ii encourage the social kingship of christ no it uncrowned christ the king and spit on him did vatican ii hold the primacy of peter no in the name of democracy the pope lowers himself to be just one bishop among the other bishops and that's not how christ establishes catholic church the pope is a monarch and he wears three crowns called the tiara is which three crowns in one the tiara you can see pictures of pope saint Pius x wearing the great tiara because he is pope and he is a monarch of the church and he has to answer to christ as his vicar not as his successor as his vicar to pass down the catholic faith and not change it not compromise it and not try to please the world so 50 years after vatican ii we see the disaster of the church and so many souls as a consequence who are going to hell so many souls who are lost and the mass destroyed the source of all grace which is the cross the heart of jesus giving 
pouring out His divine love in the Mass and filling your souls with His grace and washing away your sins with His confession, with confession by His precious blood. All that has been completely changed in the new church. Confession now is hardly heard of, and the Mass has been turned into a Protestant service. And most new Masses now, you can say, are invalid. Most of them now are invalid. Why? 20, 30 years ago, Archbishop Lefebvre said, some of them still can be valid if the priest has the proper matter, form, and intention. But he says, since many of the young priests in the new seminaries are no longer taught what the Mass really is, that it is a sacrifice, and they have to have that intention as the Council of Trent defines what the Mass is, and if they don't have that intention, but they have the Vatican II idea of the Mass, they no longer even have the intention of the Church. So many new Masses are even invalid. And so, what a disaster we are in. And all the sacraments have been attacked. And Satan wants the sacraments to dry up. He wants them destroyed. Because the seven sacraments instituted by Christ give his grace. They elevate man to share in the divine life by grace. And they wash away his sins. And they feed him with the divine heart of Jesus and his precious blood that nourishes your souls and strengthens your souls. Satan wants the sacraments abolished. And that's why um, Archbishop Lefebvre, thank God, as foretold 300 years ago by the Blessed Virgin Mary in Quito, in Ecuador, Archbishop Lefebvre was that prelate to rise up to defend the Catholic faith, to defend the Catholic priesthood and to pass the priesthood into the, the 20th century. And he, and he continued that with the consecration of four bishops. And these bishops, their duty, as he told them himself, your duty as bishops is to keep united in the faith first. And don't seek any foolish agreements with Rome until Rome comes back to tradition. And in his, in his own words, he says, don't seek any false agreement until Rome, until we have a perfectly Catholic Pope. And then you can submit your obedience to such a good Pope, and uh, God will do with the society what he pleases. And the Society of St. Pius X would have served its purpose. But the enemies got into the Society of St. Pius X. They infiltrated it. And now we have the sad spectacle in the last, in 2012, Bishop Follet signing a doctrinal de declaration, basically accepting Vatican II, basically accepting the new Mass as legitimate, basically accepting the, the new Code of Canon Law, the new profession of faith that Archbishop Lefebvre condemned. And uh, he accepts the religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, and so many weasel words, he accepts it. This is, this is very serious. This is a betrayal of our Catholic faith from the very top of the SSSPX. And it's a tragedy. And so we're three years after this. And now we're seeing uh, the, the Superior General, he is celebrating with Pope Francis the Jubilee Year of Mercy, starting in December 8th, which was the official closing of Vatican II 50 years ago. It is celebrating Vatican II, folks. Do you think Archbishop of Feb would celebrate this destruction of the church, Archbishop Lefebvre would tell the Pope, Holy Father, we don't want to celebrate this council, which is what destroyed the Catholic faith and has taken many souls to hell. We cannot celebrate this. But Arch what did Bishop Follet said? He said, with all our heart, we warmly receive this offer from the Holy Father and we, we will celebrate this year of mercy. And apparently it is being said that Pope Francis has offered another um, agreement with Bishop Follet, and uh, he apparently he wants this agreement before the Year of Mercy begins. So there we are. The Society of St. Pius X infiltrated. It has already caved in. 
And now you've got priests calling the Tridentine, Tridentine Latin Mass in Germany, in Canada, and in Austria. They're now calling it and putting it in their bulletins, calling it the Extraordinary Mass, <laughs> which is the insult put in and invented by Pope Benedict XVI. Putting the real Catholic Mass of the Latin Rite called Extraordinary on the shelf and the ordinary, that if you admit the extraordinary Mass, you admit the ordinary Mass. And what's the ordinary Mass for the Vatican II Conciliar Church? The new poisonous new Mass. And we've got Society of St. the X Priests now using this terminology. And uh, the Superior General celebrating this year of mercy. And uh, more and more signs of the, the decay of the Society of St. X from within. It's very, very sad. But the devil is, goes about like a raging lion seeking whom he may devour. He knows his time is short. And that's why he's doubling all his attacks against all Catholic families. You all suffer in some way. You know the, the turmoil of, of this crisis. You know, we all feel it in our, in our whole heart, our whole mind. We suffer through this terrible crisis. And we long for the day of a good Pope to once and for all consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Pope Francis and the bishops just blew it again. Last month, that was their time to consecrate Russia. There they were, the Pope and all the bishops of the world. That was the time to do it. And because they didn't do it and spat in the face of the Mother of God, the vengeance of God is going to hit. And it's already hitting Europe right now. Right now, floods, floods of Muslims are pouring into Europe. They're coming up through, from the Middle East, up through uh, Yugoslavia, up through um, parts of France, parts of Italy, into Germany. And they are leaving, uh, looting, raping, destroying the police don't even know what to do with these people. And uh, these are not old ladies coming in that need this, uh, a shelter. These are young fighting men. Mostly young men. These are soldiers. This is the Trojan horse for the West. And the West, the liberal West, is applauding them. You've got lines of people in Germany holding signs saying, Welcome to Germany. As they're pouring in. And they're not there to become Germans and obey the German state laws or the laws of the country or in England or in France. They are there to turn Europe to Islamism, to Muhammad, to Allah. And they themselves declare it. They declare an open war. And when they declare the Jihad, as the prophecies say, there will be blood flowing in France and in Europe up to the ankles. And it's a punishment from God for the sins of the, of the Western countries, including ours and Europe and Canada and South America. It's a punishment from God. God has always allowed the Muslims to be the instrument of his justice. And in the old saner days, when Catholic Europe started to maybe falter and grow lukewarm, God would send, allow the hordes of the Muslims to start invading. But then you still had good popes who rallied the Catholic leaders and princes and kings and all the men to rise up to fight to defend Catholic Europe. And in a saner day, the Pope declared the Great Crusades, the Holy Wars. And so any man fighting, any boys going with their dads to fight, and if they died in battle against the Muslims, the Pope granted them a plenary indulgence. So that if they died with the right dispositions, they could go straight to heaven. It was a glorious time, a great time, when the Popes understood their duties. And now Pope Francis, is he call, calling a crusade? No. He's shaking hands with the Muslims and kissing their Koran. And that's a horrible scandal, because the Koran is a is a it's the book of the muslims and that book should be burned it's a piece of trash it's loaded with immorality the most foul immorality 
and they believe, convert by the sword. And if anyone leaves the Muslim religion, they are to be killed. And the, the, it's, a, it's a corrupt, corrupt twisting. And it's not even a religion because there is no sacrifice. It's a psychosis at most. It's an infidelity at most. And so the Muslims pouring into Europe is a true punishment. And when they rise up <coughs> to slaughter the Europeans, it's going to be a, a, a wake-up call. And as you know, Germany and Italy and even France, they are now, they, have, they are so loaded with abortion and contraception, they have more deaths now than births. And they don't want children. The ladies that are married, if they're married, they don't want children. It's, we are so sick, so twisted in our age. The old ladies of the old ancient days, up until <coughs> basically the Renaissance, the end of the Middle Ages, every woman that was married wanted to have many children. It was considered a blessing from God. It was a great thing. And only the modern twisted thinking does everything to stop children. <coughs> so, dear faithful, in this, we are now 50 years after Vatican II. The Society of Pius X has caved in. The resistance has risen up throughout the world. That is, one bishop, Bishop Williamson, <coughs> who himself says, I don't want to lead. So we're kind of left. He did consecrate a bishop, thank God. He still confirms, thank God, but he doesn't want to lead. He doesn't believe in an organization. He doesn't believe in his organized resistance. He doesn't believe in the Council of Trent Seminaries. So we have a problem. And I don't understand why. Why he's doing this. But pray for him. I don't understand it. Because any normal good bishop would call for organization and structure to fight the enemy. That's his duty. And I dare say, for any bishop failing in their duty, they will answer a lot before God. So pray for good Bishop Williamson. We all love him. We all know him. But he has to do his duty. And when he, for example, says that it's okay to go to the new Mass, if it fulfills your uh, e emotional needs, <coughs> he's wrong. I'm sorry, he's wrong. And just like we have to say Bishop Fillet is wrong with his liberalism, and the Pope Francis is wrong with his liberalism and modernism, we have to, as loyal sons of Christ, remind Bishop Williamson, no, you are wrong to say it's okay to go to the new Mass. And you're also wrong to dissolve all structure, because Archbishop Lefebvre believed in structure and organization, and he did it. And thanks to Archbishop Lefebvre, you and I have the faith. Because he did establish missions, a seminaries, five of them throughout the world, and priories, and statutes, and a rule for seminary life, <coughs> and, and retreats for his priests. He established all this. It was organization and structure, and that's the survival of the faith. Christ himself established organization and structure. Twelve apostles ordained bishops, and one of them a monarch of the church, the Pope. So we are in a deep, deep crisis, even now, three years into the resistance. And now we see infiltrators within the resistance. And let me tell you how to detect them, okay? It's going to be very simple, ten questions. Any priest who comes to you, and we may we even say also bishop, any priest or bishop of the resistance that comes to you, put to them ten simple questions. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through them right now. And if they can answer yes to these questions, stay away from them. He is not true resistance. And what, what does it mean to be Catholic resistance? What does it mean to be the Society of St. Pius X, Marian Corps, as we called it? Our resistance. It is simply that we want to hold the Catholic faith, maintain the kingship of Christ, as Archbishop Lefebvre did. To hold the line, as, as Archbishop Lefebvre did, who himself held the line of all the popes before Vatican II. 
That was his greatness. That was his humility. That was his great courage in the face of the destruction of the church. So uh, here's the ten questions to ask any priest and bishop of the resistance. Do you believe and accept Vatican II? Yes or no? Do you accept Vatican II as able to be saved if it's interpreted in a traditional understanding? Yes or no? Do you accept Bishop Fillet's doctrinal declaration of April 15, 2012? Yes or no? Do you accept that the new Mass is legitimately promulgated? Yes or no? Do you, ex do you admit religious liberty of the Council is somehow reconcilable with the Church's magisterium? Yes or no? Bishop Fillet says yes. He signed on it. Do you think it's okay to attend the new Mass? Yes or no? Do you think it's do you deny religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality are are great heresies repeatedly condemned by all the popes before Vatican II? Do you deny this? Yes or no? Do you think any priest or bishop can be trusted who claim to be with the resistance but give ambiguous answers to above direct questions as the above ones and fails to make a clear declaration of his position. And all most priests of the resistance have made a declaration where they stand, but some have not. And one in particular was asked by the faithful, why did you leave the society? And he dodged the question. He would not answer the question. And we have a duty. Archbishop Lefebvre said that the faithful have a right to know where their priests stand. Especially now in this crisis. And if you got a priest that doesn't make clear where he stands with Archbishop Lefebvre and with Bishop Follet's doctrinal declaration and his, and his modernism, then you got a problem. Do you agree that it is okay? and posits no danger to the faith if one keeps going to the indult multiproprio mass or of St. Peter's fraternity mass are now the conciliar SSPX masses yes or no do you agree it's okay and posits no danger to the faith yes or no do you think Archbishop Lefebvre was against reconciliation with modernist Rome but open to recognition from modernist Rome Yes or no? All right, now let's go through these with the Catholic answer. So you are ready for combat because you have to be ready um, because we know that there are enemies already within the resistance. In Europe, they are already working openly with Sede Vicantis. And Archbishop Lefebvre would never do this. Never. If they privately held their set of econtism, maybe he would tolerate it and say, just don't preach about it. But open public ones. There's a different ball game there. So let's go through it so your mind is clear. First, do you believe and accept Vatican II? Yes or no? The answer is no. <laughs> Archbishop Lefebvre said, the only thing we can do is a categorical refusal of Vatican II and its reforms. He says this very often, up till the day he died. Second, do you accept Vatican II as able to be saved if it's interpreted in the traditional understanding, yes or no? The answer is no. Vatican II cannot be interpreted traditionally because the poison that is built right into the very text, the heresies are in the text. It's not some abuse after. This is very important for us to understand because this is the new hermeneutics of the many society priests who are talking this way. Oh, we can interpret Vatican II in the traditional sense. That's baloney. It's false. And the, 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 the texts are openly ambiguous, which means they can be doubly interpreted. So the answer is no. So third, do you accept Bishop Follet's doctrinal declaration of April 15, 2012? No, because it, it's pure modernism. 
Do you accept that the new Mass is legitimately promulgated? Archbishop Lefebvre said, no, never. Can it be valid? Maybe. Is it legitimately promulgated? No. And you can hear Father Kramer's excellent talk showing how the new Mass, it's not legitimate at all, which means that it's good for souls and blessed by the Church. It's poison to souls, and no Pope has lawfully promulgated it. At most, you can say Paul VI issued and published a, a book, a new mass missal. Do you admit religious liberty of the council is somehow reconcilable with the church's magisterium? Yes or no? The answer is no. It's not. It's a heresy condemned by the church. It cannot be reconciled. But Bishop Follet said it can. And he signed on these very words. This is how serious the fight is. And why is religious liberty so serious a heresy? Because it uncrowns Christ the King. It makes a mockery of Christ the King. It allows all the false religions to bring in their divorce laws, abortion laws, euthanasia laws, sodomite laws, which destroy a country and a people. Next question. Do you think it's okay to attend the new Mass? What did the Archbishop Lefebvre say? <laughs> he said... You do not fulfill your Sunday obligation if you go to the new Mass. It's poisonous to your soul. You cannot go. Very simple. No. Do you deny religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality are heresies repeatedly condemned by all the popes before Vatican II? Do you deny, do you deny this? The answer is no. We, we do not deny. The popes did condemn these as heresies. Do you think any priest or bishop can be trusted who claim to be with the resistance but give ambiguous answers to above questions like the direct questions above and fail to make a clear declaration of his position? Do you think such a priest or bishop can be trusted? No, he cannot. And that's why most of the resistance priests have made declarations where they stand. Father Ringrose, Father Ortiz, Father Pfeiffer, of course, Father Chazal, Bishop Williamson made a clear declaration, uh, but some have not. And the faithful have a right to ask. They have a right to know from their priests, what do you think of Vatican II? What do you think of religious liberty? The doctrinal declaration. And you've got to ask them. And if they weasel around with, with uh, Spanish fuzzy words, don't trust them. Don't trust them. Do you agree that it was it is okay and posits no danger to the faith if one keeps going to the indult multi-proprio mass or St. Peter's fraternity mass or now the conciliar SSPX masses? The answer is no. You cannot agree that it's okay and it is dangerous to the faith. Archbishop Lefebvre said that with St. Peter's and St. Peter's agreed on less than the doctrinal declaration. Of Bishop Follet. And he said they are traitors, don't go to their new their mass, even though it's valid in the Latin Mass, because you will it'll erode your faith. And part of that erosion, said Archbishop Lefebvre, is that they don't warn you against the modernism of the Pope. They will be silent against the Pope and his modernism, silent against the modernism of the bishops. So it'll erode your faith, so you cannot. Uh, say that it's okay to go to those masses. Does that mean we condemn them and everyone's going to hell if they're not? No. In fact, we know, as Bishop Williamson once said, God has allowed the Society of St. Peter masses, has actually helped many, many souls come out of the Novice Ordo to, to the traditional mass and actually come all the way to the resistance mass. And, as, as, and as God has used it for many other souls to bring them to tradition who otherwise may not come. So God in his wisdom has allowed it, but we, we cannot approve it. And then lastly, do you think Archbishop Lefebvre was against reconciliation with modernist Rome, but open to recognition from modernist Rome? This is now the new buzz language of the new liberals within the resistance in the SSPX. 
They're saying now that Archbishop Lefebvre wanted recognition from Rome, but not an agreement. But what did Archbishop Lefebvre say? He said, <coughs> even recognition from these enemies of Christ who want to uncrown Christ, he said it, it will not work. He told Cardinal Ratzinger, you want to uncrown Christ the King, we want him crowned. You want to dethrone him, we want him enthroned. And we cannot work together. Even if you give us a bishop, even if you give us our seminaries to go on as usual, even if you let us have our Latin masses, we cannot work together because we're on diametrically opposed uh, purposes. AM, FM. And so beware of also that, that phony distinction they're throwing at you. Archbishop Lefebvre refused both a false agreement with Rome, modernist Rome, until Rome comes back to the tradition and converts to tradition. And he would not accept a false recognition because that means coming under these local bishops, coming under a modernist pope, and he said that the superiors inform, they inform the, the inferiors. And we would be swamped, he said, and we would lose the faith and tradition would come to nothing. He was so wise, Archbishop Lefebvre. And, that, that, and because the bishops that he consecrated are no longer holding his clear-cut stand, everything is falling to pieces. It's a punishment from God for my sins, for our sins. So pray for the four bishops. Pray for Bishop Follet. Uh, what can we do? I hope he rejects his doctrinal declaration before he dies. I hope he does. For the sake of his soul. So dear faithful, we must hold on to the clear line of Archbishop Lefebvre. It's not that we're guru adorers of Archbishop Lefebvre. He was the first to say, if I no longer teach the faith of tradition, don't follow me. If I compromise with the new mass, don't follow me. He was the first to say that. And he would also say, I am not the chief of traditionalists. I'm only a bishop doing my duty. And so Archbishop Lefebvre, his stand was so clear and so well balanced and so Catholic. And he promoted the kingship of Christ. And how do we know Rome will convert? Is it going to be, as Father Rostand said years, a few years ago, when Rome uh, allows recognition of tradition more and more? That's not the conversion of Rome that Archbishop Lefebvre spoke about. The conversion of Rome that he spoke about was, in his own words, if Rome wants to come and discuss again, he said, I will put the question on the doctrinal level. And I will ask the Pope, do you believe in Pius IX's syllabus of errors in Quanta Cura that condemn the modern errors of liberalism? Do you accept the anti-modernist those of Pius X and Pascendi? Do you accept Leo XIII's doctrine on, this, on the condemning the separation of church and state? And Pius XI on the social kingship of Christ? And do you accept all the popes and their teachings up until Pius XII? Which means they have to condemn Vatican II. <laughs> and if you don't accept these and proclaim them, there can be no agreement. It's impossible. That's when will Rome will convert. Has that day come? No. And now the days are worse than ever. And we see the wrath of God coming more and more on this earth. The Virgin Mary said, the chalice is filling up, and now it is overflowing. And she said, I can, the only thing holding the arm of God's justice from striking the, this earth is her intercession. And that's why our rosary is so important. The power of that weapon of the rosary. We don't even realize the power of this weapon. You know, in Tolkien's story, Frodo fights with a, a sword called Sting. And this sword enables him to uh, acquire and accomplish huge feats against all enemies. And it's a little sword. 
And of course, Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, the trilogy, he was Catholic, traditional Catholic. He refused to go to the new mass. And uh, he said the whole work is a fundamentally Catholic work. And some like it, some don't. You don't. And he would say that himself. You don't have to like his works. But God, the Virgin Mary has given us something far more powerful than Frodo's sword called Sting and a ring that makes you turn invisible. She gives us the rosary and the scapular. She told St. Dominic, one day I will save the world through the rosary and the scapular. Because you won't be able to find a mass. You won't be able to go to a mass because the priests have all accepted Vatican II or are compromised with Vatican II in some way. So how are you going to keep the faith? And you get mass, well, how many, what, every three months or four months? Some places less, some more. And she saw these days, so we got to love the rosary and pray it well. It is a powerful weapon. And you dads who are worried about paying the bills, if you say the rosary and the family together, Our Lady will take care of your bills. She knows your worries. She's your mother in heaven. And you mothers who are overwhelmed um, and, and are generous with God, and God bless you for taking the children He sends you. She will help you. She knows this is rough. We don't have Catholic schools to send our kids to anymore. And we have to restart them. And we don't have even convents and seminaries we can trust anymore. So we're at a crazy time in the church history. And the anger of God hanging, hanging by a thread. But our daily rosary can appease the anger of God and bring about the victory of the Virgin Mary by crushing his head when the Pope will finally, finally consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart. So dear faithful, persevere, and uh, let's ask the Mother of God to strengthen us, give us a great love for her divine Son, who will be very soon come down like fire from heaven on this altar. And the fire of the Sacred Heart of Jesus will be given to you in Holy Communion. We adore his sacrifice of the cross, and all the graces and merits of the cross are poured out to you in Holy Communion. So open wide your hearts so our Lord can fill your, your cups, your chalices, your barrels with the sweet wine of his grace and the fire of his divine love. Because he, he wants that. What will I but that my, my... I have come to cast fire on the earth. What will I but that this fire burn in you, be enkindled in you? To do all our homework, our chores, our duties of state, homeschooling, chopping wood, doing dishes, cleaning toilets. You ever do that? And uh, changing diapers and cleaning dishes and, and mixing concrete and hammer rails and all the daily chores. Do these things out of love for God. That's the secret of Fatima. And by doing these things with much love of God, you will help the Virgin Mary bring about her victory. You will help her snatch souls from eternal damnation and you will bring release many souls in purgatory and glorify God and make reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus and Mary. O oh, Mary conceived without sin. O oh, Mary conceived without sin. O oh, Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.